time. I'm Curtis, I'm with a company called Trendy. I'm with two of my colleagues, Celine and Chloe. Uh, so they're on the marketing side, I'm on the partnership side. If you have any questions, they'll answer them. I'll probably run away, but uh, I wanted to thank them. Um, if you haven't seen us, and, and Chloe's got the shirt on, uh, it does say, uh, food waste. Uh, we talk about it, we have been challenged on it, and uh, we've always sort of thought that we should be loud about the conversation. And so some people have commented whatever they think about the shirt, some people really love it, and it's always generating conversation. And so I was just uh, curious to know if, maybe just by a show of hands, you know, how often are we talking about food waste, or to, are you guys thinking about food waste more now after the pandemic, or has it always sort of been in your head, or do you think about it now more? A little bit more? No? Still the same level? I think yeah. grocery prices make you think about it in your own home a little Sure, more. yeah. And is there more conversation? Do you hear about it more in the news, or are you, when you go out, do restaurants talk about it, or grocery stores have signage about it, or anything like that? No? Not so much. Okay. It's big out in, it's getting bigger out in Vancouver, and that's sort of, you know, where that shift comes in. So, um, we are three years in ideation. We're about a year and a half since our first employee. So when you start seeing what we've done, it's pretty impressive, but we're a Vancouver-based startup, um, co-founded uh, male female by a couple, Greg and Carissa, um, and uh, they sent me. So we are an innovation-based company that's tackling food waste at the source. So we want to address otherwise wasted food uh, at farm level. Um, I'm a stats guy. I just came from that mental health session that was earlier. She had this great slide about the percentage of people that are affected by mental health. Uh, I, I think the same way. I'm very metric based. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of these, and if you haven't, some of them get really big, but we're throwing away 2.5 billion tons of food globally. Okay. Contextually, that might not mean anything. If we grew 400 trillion tons, I guess that would be a big deal, but that's the number we're throwing away. The counter argument is that over 800 million are underserviced. Okay? I think that's a low number, kind of post-pandemic, but that's sort of the latest one we've pulled. We just hit over 8 billion people last week, so call it whatever percentage that is. It doesn't matter. We have 800 million people underserviced. I've never sort of thought about where my next meals come from. Like, I've always been pretty lucky that way, but I'm certainly not the only one, and that's not a great stat that we should be living on. Sometimes it's really hard to think really big. You think that, you know, you say 2.5 billion, or you think in terms of federal budgets in the trillions, it's hard to wrap your head when your budget's in the hundreds and the thousands. So why don't we bring this down to Canada specific? 35.5 million tons of waste in Canada, 60% of produced food is also being thrown out. 48% happens at the farm level. Uh, we think it's a bit higher in the kind of mid 50s, high 50s range, but there is always food that is grown at the farm level that you, you wouldn't eat or you wouldn't serve other people. So we don't count that. We still want to go and rescue a huge percentage. Again, contextually, you know, we're a huge country. We have a lot of farmland, so maybe we do throw, throw away quite a bit. But the flip side, one in eight households. 4.4 million people, we've got 38 million people in the country, do the math, still not good, right? Throwing away 48%, one in 12, call it, uh, or sorry, 12% is, is being underserviced. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the math, it doesn't matter if you're good or bad at math, none of it sounds good. Um, because I'm a stats guy, I was actually doing some research on some other things just to put it into your own head. Um, I went on to uh, Zero Waste Council, I attended a conference there a few months ago and sort of got into their website a little bit. And it's kind of post-pandemic numbers, so it's kind of been pandemic. 63% of food that's wasted in the household is avoidable. So then you start thinking, okay, well, what's my world like? I buy avocados, try to get to all of them. Sometimes I don't get them on the right, perfect. Throw them out, okay, that's terrible. Bananas, I don't make banana bread, I don't put them in my freezer, I'm terrible that way. But that's one of those things, I buy four, I get to three, well I just thrown out 25%, like let's get real about this stuff. And you know, there are other people that could have used it, so 63% seems high, household. Grow that to a year, 140 kilos is what's being thrown away personally on a household, $1,300 is the value, food prices are going up, add a few hundred dollars to that, we talked about food prices, that 1300 is probably closer to 15 or 1700 that's crappy when everything else is getting really expensive everywhere in the country, okay? 
Um, Alberta, I'm from Vancouver, so I think a little bit more that way, but Alberta has the highest food insecurity rate in the country at 20%. So I don't know what's happening here, but uh, you're a little worse. We're not great, we're really expensive, so, you know, but uh, Alberta's got the highest food insecurity rate. Not by much, but it's kind of Alberta to Brunswick. BC's kind of that fifth, sixth range, but something to think about. Um, if food waste were a country, it would be the third highest in emissions, so that's always something to think about. So if we tackle food waste as a, approached it like a country, right, we would be tackling something bigger on the planet side of things, so that's probably pretty important to think about. And this is actually my favorite one. This is, uh, we have four times the amount of food charities or organizations that are fighting food insecurity than we do grocery stores. So we have about 15,300 grocery stores, four employees or more, right? So the mom and dad shop maybe doesn't count, but 15,300 grocery stores selling to 90, 87.5% of the population. And we have over 61,000 organizations fighting food security for the 12 and a half percent. We can cut that a whole bunch of different ways. That's not right. And not that you can just sort of change the world, but if all those not-for-profits got together and had the buying power of all these grocery stores, it would look a lot different. So that's kind of the one that really messed with my head, but something to think about. Uh, food, food waste is, is at every level, right? It's the consumer, the restaurant, the hotel, um, the grocery store, the food loss, the largest part of it is at the farm level. So we try to tackle it from the producer side. We support everybody. So, you know, we'll, we have a pledge, the marketing team can talk to you about a pledge that we have where we just want the dialogue to continue. So if you're talking about food waste at your home or you work at Save On or Safeway, it's all important. We'll talk to you about it. We want you as part of the conversation. But we're tackling it from a a producer level, and that's because that's where that 48, 50% is. That's the biggest part that we can, we feel we can change. Why is food wasted? Um, lots of different reasons. You know, I felt coming to this conference, and still feel this conference, I'm super undermatched when it comes to your guys' life and what you guys are working on farms. I'm very new to this sector, um, and tech is starting to change that. I don't know if anything here is something that you don't know, right? Food is ugly. Grocery stores don't buy the not so good looking food. And to be fair, if you go now into a grocery store and watch other people shop for food, they still pick it up, pick the nicer one, which is crazy because I'm gonna cut it 10 minutes later once I get to my kitchen. So it really doesn't matter what it looks like. It's gonna taste pretty good. So that's one reason. Climate change, there's been a lot of talk in there. Wasteful processing, that's always, I always think of the little carrot, right? You got all these carrots that grow in different sizes. Someone decided one day, you know what, we'll put a bag where all the carrots were bite-sized pieces and let's shape that and throw away the rest of the carrot. Well, that's probably not great. It's great for parties and it's great for dips and all that kind of stuff, but probably not the best and there's a lot of industries that do that and there's a lot of money that goes into that. Global affairs, COVID pandemic, wasteful policies. You look at what France is doing. It's illegal to throw up food at certain levels of the supply chain. We don't do that in Canada, North America. So Europe's kind of changing that and hopefully our government and, and some of our policies will start changing so that we take food waste a bit more seriously. One of the things on here, but food is against time, right? We travel with food. So it goes from producer, farm level, to processor, manufacturer, distributor, retail, consumer, consumption. And every time the apple, the watermelon, the potato goes along, it's carried and, and time essentially is what expires, okay? And you don't, we don't see it, right? Sometimes it's out of sight, out of mind, but time is really one of the biggest enemies of food. Um, so here's the proposal, right? You, we've identified the problem, we've kind of punched in the face with it. This is what we're trying to do. We're gonna try and extend the life or the shelf life of the existing food that we're throwing away anyways. We are gonna propose that we're gonna try and keep 97% of the nutrients in flavor, and we're gonna lessen the transportation. Okay, that is what our innovation does. The solution is that we're going to go right to the farm. So a lot of the processing and the manufacturing takes place after the farm, right? So there's food waste at the farm, there's probably something that expires before it, all those steps along the way. We're going to try and tackle it right at farm level. We're going to use an innovation that we call Biotrim. If you Google Biotrim, not a lot's going to come up. It's just going to be our company. But our solution is Biotrim. 
okay, which I'll get into in a minute, we're going to upcycle your ingredients. So all that food that's wasted, we're going to take it, we're going to create value out of it, we're going to formulate recipes and food from it, and we're going to upcycle the otherwise wasted food. And then we'll use the wholesale or food manufacturing parts of that distribution, but this is when we have a longer shelf life. So we're going to take that six or seven step supply chain, we're going to start over here and make things last longer, and we're just going to shorten the whole chain. And that's what we're going to propose to do. In all this, we're going to try to accelerate regional economies and regional circularity. So I always think about with the holidays coming up, blueberry pie, strawberry pie, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. And if we have strawberry pie, we're going to go buy strawberries. They're probably going to be from California or Mexico or something like that, which have to be flown in. Okay. But we, in British Columbia, we grow great blueberries and strawberries in our province. But we can't buy one in December, but we throw out millions of tons of them in July, August, September. So if we can save those ones in July and August and cook with them in December, then we don't have to buy the ones that, are, that have to be flown in, right? So now there's going to be less travel across the world, less emissions across the world. Uh, that being said, we have to learn how to cook with something different. But essentially, we're going to try and regionalize what we grow locally. So that whole farm to table dining that restaurants are talking about, we're going to try and do that on the consumer level for the whole food supply chain. Super ambitious, kind of crazy, we'll get there. This is a grid that we had for one of our clients who we'll talk about in a minute, but we're trying to use what's localized. So if we grow it in BC, Alberta, in Canada, and we rescue it, then in the other seasons where those foods don't normally grow, we're going to try and use it at the other times of year. So everything will stay local. I'm not saying don't have, we can't get mangoes in Canada, if you can still buy those, we like the taste of those. But in things like a pie, where you don't have to have the strawberry in it, but it tastes like strawberry pie, and it tastes the same, and that's very theoretical and hard to wrap your head around, it still tastes the same, you just have to cook in a different way. As crazy as that sounds, I've had like blueberry crepes with blueberry powder, and it actually tastes exactly the same. So these are not theoretical, and I have something to show you guys in a minute that will kind of make you think. The closest iteration we have to um, bring it to reality is we have, this whole idea actually started with the, the smoothie machine. So we have a vending machine that will sell you a juice or a smoothie from upcycled fruits and vegetables. This is a real thing. It's not theoretical. There are five that are going to be placed in YBRR Airport in December the 15th, so that's the running date. So you'll be able to go into our airport and get a juice or a smoothie from upcycled fruits and vegetables. Real thing, and we'll go down the iteration of that later. But if it's upcycled fruits and vegetables and give you a cold drink, if you take something like carrots, add hot water, carrot soup, well now all of a sudden you've got hot meals, you know, that are all nutritious and probably better for you than maybe what you're getting in some of the other stores or retailers out there. So, something to think about, but uh, smoothie machine starting with YVR, and hopefully we push those across the planet. You can ask questions about this, uh, this smoothie machine uh, later on. So let's get into Biotrim. Biotrim is, it was an idea in theory not too long ago. I think, I guess we probably had one in August, it feels like. So it's only been around for a couple months, but imagine a really big mobile shipping container. It's exactly what it looks like. Uh, in this unit that goes to the farm, we're going to take your produce, put it in the bio trim, and we are going to process it in there before we leave farm, before heavy things have to travel. So we're going to wash and sanitize it, we're going to pre-process it, going to cut it and dice it so it gets all the uniform size, and we're going to essentially freeze dry it. There'll be blended technologies because different commodities are going to need different types of drying, but we're essentially going to freeze dry it. Dehydrating is kind of the easiest explanation. We're going to take it all the way down to a powder. The powder is what's going to harness that 97% nutrient base. Now that all the moisture has gone out of the way, it's now 10% of the weight at 18 months to three years shelf life with the proper packaging. Okay, so that's kind of all those three wish lists that we talked about, lighter and weight, um, you know, less water, right, and keeping the nutrient base and extending the shelf life. We've now accomplished all three. Well, now we have to sell the powder. So we're going to formulate those ingredients. 
right? We travel along that supply chain at a much lesser footprint across the planet, and we're going to formulate recipes. Well, now we've got to educate people on how to cook with powder. That's that whole blueberry pie with powder. But you're not going to buy the blueberries from for, for Christmas time. You're going to buy the blueberry powder and have a great blueberry pie for Christmas. Okay. Uh, sorry, last point is we show we have a revenue share model. We'll get to the business model in a minute, but we're going to. The farm gets the money for the produce, so that there's a full revenue share back to the farm, right? So I'm going to take it and say thank you, see you later. But the whole idea is to get the farmers to a revenue line for them because they're growing this much, they're selling this much, they're throwing this away, so let's give them a percentage of the revenue once we sell the powder. So there's a full cycle of economic. Just before July or August, this is how we were trying to explain and sell this. Food for us is expensive in every way. $370 billion worth of food is lost annually at the farm stage. We spend so much to produce all this food, but throw so much of it away. And unpredictable weather and markets make it challenging to reduce this waste. But it doesn't have to be this way. Biotrim rescues, processes, and preserves food at farms and facilities through mobile servicing for more permanent on-site installations, saving unused food before it gets thrown away. Biotrim breaks the cycle of food waste by turning otherwise wasted food into shelf-stable ingredients with 97% of their original nutrients. That can be sold to make drinks and blended beverages, packaged and fortified food, textiles and construction material, pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. BioTrip helps you turn food loss into food revenue and help reduce the 2.5 billion tons of annual food waste. So we can help feed the 800 million people facing severe food insecurity. BioTrip your food today it's trendy. So selling a multi-billion dollar expensive innovation to a farm before they can actually see it or touch it is pretty complicated. So this was really a theory. We needed someone to kind of come along and be an initial innovator. Uh, we have that now. I'll get into that. But uh, we have a Biotrim 80. I'll explain what the number means in a minute. Uh, we have one in Vancouver. Uh, we're trying to move it to a farm so we can continue our commodity testing. But we actually have a Biotrim 1000 go on, on a boat going to Ecuador right now. So come early in the year, we're really doing it. It's become the thing. The smoothie machine will have upcycled fruit from this particular farm in Ecuador. And um, we will, then we just sort of keep selling them and then we'll have powder uh, by Q2 next year. Some say Q1, let's just be real and do Q2, let's be fair. We all know nothing goes according to plan, so let's, let's say that. Um, the Biotrim is scalable. When we first started this idea, you know, you, you sort of think we need something that's going to be mobile and start taking a farm, so let's put it on wheels and start taking it to places. And what we found out is that the first few, couple of people that were really interested in us had these huge farms and were wasting so much that they needed a larger unit. So the Biotrim 80, which is the one we have, it's a little show version back home, uh, and the 1,000 that's going down to Ecuador, the number relates to the amount of moisture that can be extracted per day. So a Biotrim 1,000 is 1,000 kilos of moisture extracted per day for a commodity. So at about a 10% weight, 1,000 kilos of moisture is 1,100 kilos of product, right? So there's going to be more moisture in the blueberry than a carrot, so it'll be a lot of one, less of the other, but you get the idea. Um, this is completely scalable. So if you're a huge farm and you need a 2,500, 25,000, 10,000, we can build you that. It's just where there's more components to it. And at some point, it doesn't become mobile. It becomes a macro unit. So the 1,000 is mobile. Uh, our early conversation suggests that we won't be building one of these for a bit. If we really build one at one of our, our airport, um, they actually grow food on Sea Highland by our airport, but it's surrounded by a bunch of farm communities. We can rescue all that food in that farm community and service, use those blueberries for blueberry bars in the, in the winter at our airport. That's a cool story. We're, we're going to be the most sustainable airport in the world by 2030. That's one of their goals. We want to be along for the ride. But this is completely scalable. And so 
it's really a matter of how much you're wasting and of course the budget and the cost, that's super relevant. The farm we're talking to in Ontario, currently wasting 15 million tons of tomatoes and peppers a year. That's a lot. I thought he was kidding when he first said it. You know, me not knowing food scale, I thought he meant 1.5 and he said, oh no, it's 15 million. And so he wants a Biotrim 5,000, that's going to be a little bit more money, right? But he has the money. He's a hugely successful farm and, you know, he's kind of wondering if we can really sell the powder. Fair enough. So if we go get a purchase order for some powder or we get the Ecuador guys to kind of do it, then maybe that'll nudge him closer to doing a cooperative model with us and then let's start doing it. You start learning a lot of weird things when you start having these conversations. Started talking to a guy in Boston, celery producer, six million tons of celery he's throwing out. Only throwing them out because the grocery store's his biggest client says, you gotta cut the top four inches of celery off, everything. Because otherwise they won't fit in the box and the grocery stores won't change the size of the shelf. It's the only reason. So you're just gonna throw away six million tons of celery, perfectly good celery, so that it all looks the same, and so the people going to the grocery stores say, oh, they're all the same. That's kind of weird. Well, it's not weird, it's actually not normal. But that's what we're grown to sort of know. And so you meet these people, and when you say, about a is a couple million dollars, they're like, are you on 100 million in celery? We can do three, four million. That's kind of the conversation we're having. Now, theoretically, if the BioTrim Mobile was to be <coughs> in the middle of a community and it could drive around, or we build a big enough unit in a community of five smaller farms, we could bring the product. We're still lowering the footprint, it's less ideal. A little bit more work managing a few more accounts, but it still works. So I went to a zero waste facility in Minneapolis, and these guys are upcycling grain and, and so forth. They put it right in the middle of three breweries, took all of their waste, and started making breads and crackers and things like that. So they had the idea to drop it in the middle of a community really smart. We could technically we could do the same, a little bit of a different model, and we'd have, to have different deals with everyone, but it would still kind of work. We're still going to rescue all the all the product benefits. Powder. So I keep talking about powder, we call them ingredients, uh, but probably a good thing for you guys to get a sense of what we're talking about. I brought one, and if you guys hadn't gone to the booth that Celine and Chloe were at, there were some there. Uh, there was three flavors there, three kinds there. Um, this is the berry one, so if you just sort of want to get an idea, smell it, touch it. Let me not touch it, let's just smell it and get a sense of what it looks like. Let's not test things. Um, this is what we're talking about. 97% of the weight, um, sorry, 90% nutrient based, 10% um, of the weight. When I'm talking about powders and ingredients, this is what we're talking about. We have three types there. It was originally um, designed to be kind of a water enhancer or a juice or a smoothie. So add a little bit of water, think of those emergency packets, and that's kind of your vitamin C. Add a few of them, and it's a juice, it can be a smoothie, things like that. This is where we take the powders of the different commodities. And formulate recipes in our in our product team or our science team. Okay. What's possible? You know, when you let our our founder Craig, uh, who's a who's a acclaimed chef, and we have a few other scientists and, and food people in our in our team, and you let them run away with ideas of what we can do, it gets a little daunting. But there's so much that we could do that goes beyond human consumption. Easy to think about compost, easy to think about pet, pet food, and things like that. Um, we started with the mission, Greg has fought food insecurity in his life, so we think about the human side of first, but there are other uses, whether it, thank you. Uh, there are other uses for it, whether that be for, you know, I always think that gives drinks, I'm thinking about putting in an alcoholic drink, but you know what I mean. Um, we can get into pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, textiles, things like that. Um, this is where that commodity testing really takes place. We want to put, currently the Biotrim 80 in Vancouver, we're trying to get it to our university. If we get it to our university and allow the students to play with it and figure out, let's start doing celery, it's probably like the strongest fiber, right? That's going to be, tech. there's going to be value in the textiles there. There's going to be value in other things, not just the orange, but the orange peel, the orange pulp. Things like that. What can we do with it? We want it. We don't want to throw away the rest of it. Like juice companies are great. They squeeze the orange. You have the delicious orange juice. They throw away the orange. We want to use the remains of everything. So that's part of the other side of it. Okay. Um, that process is called fractionation. So we have small team. You know, we're still pre-revenueish. So you know, still small. Um, 
this is where we want to let our imagination run wild. We are wildly ambitious. We also know that everything I've described to you is crazy, right? We're not talking about food insecurity in Vancouver. We're talking about food security across the planet. We'll start with Canada. Maybe we'll get lucky. The government will buy it and we'll actually take it to purpose and help the rest of the world. But really, our early conversations and everywhere we go and every food innovation conference that we talk to, people come and talk to us and it's everywhere. Food insecurity and food waste doesn't have borders. So Ecuador is our first client. We're having conversations in the Netherlands. We're having conversations in Canada, the US, and Mexico. This is not, maybe not what we were expecting. We just assumed our first client would be in Canada. <laughs> it looks like our third or fourth might be. So in that case, we're going to have to learn about the commodities of what's being grown in that part of the world. So that fractionation, that science team will really become a part of this formula. Uh, that's some of the 
big scale thoughts if you want to build, you know, five units, eighty-five percent capacity, three hundred million, hugely ambitious. You tell this to investors, they kind of laugh you out the door. Some would be like, "Yeah, but what you're doing is cool, and I get it, and we want to come along for the ride." So we are lucky; we're an impact company. We've turned away our first biotrim client when he said, "If there's more value in powder, why would I sell apples?" And Craig went up to him like, "No, we don't want that. We want people that are in moral line with what we're trying to do." And we walked away from our first deal to the business development team, the finance team. You're like, "You're crazy," but you know, we want people and investors that don't want to 10x their money, but want to 4x in a longer amount of time. That want to do good by the planet, and we're going to try and stick to that as long as we can. You know, be part of the solution. It's pretty easy. Uh, we don't go into a lot of rooms. We talk about this all the time. We don't go a lot into a lot of rooms where people aren't at least fascinated with what we're talking about. They may challenge the idea. They may challenge the economics. Not too many people think food waste isn't a problem. You know, I think they may not know how to tackle it. Maybe they don't know how to tackle it at the farm level. They can only tackle it at the consumer level, maybe the restaurant level. Um, but we want everyone engaged. Uh, the marketing team has a pledge. You can go to trendy.com and sign our pledge. It'll keep you in the loop on how to tackle food waste in you and your community and your homes and things like that. That's part of what this team here does. Uh, we're going to be coming up with a restaurant pledge to encourage restaurants to educate consumers on how they can uh, tackle food waste. A long time ago, with straws. Let's not keep using straws. We still use straws. I think I used them last night. Um, but you know, you know, when it comes to, do you need the line? You know, sometimes you don't need the line, but it's given to you. Right? If you don't want it, that's food waste, things like that. And that can get really big when you get in the front of house, back of house, things like that. But uh, if you get involved with us, uh, stick around and sign our, sign our pledge. And that's it. If you have questions for us or Selena and Chloe and how this conference has been, hit me. Let's do it. What does it cost for a unit to be installed on a farm? Yeah, so the um, BT 1000 well, is going to Ecuador. Somewhere between 3.5 and 4. So, will it be viable for like the Canadian producer, say in the Valley, to put it on their farm? Yeah, good question. And we, you know, when we first had this, we had always believed the mobile version was, was we were going to operate it and then kind of be like a lease to own. So, every time we come by, we're going to charge you. But then you get revenue, you still get revenue share, right? But there's a cash flow issue, right? Um, when we started talking to the farms that were of a bigger size, um, money seems to be less of an issue. There's still doubt of this will work, but um, it seems to be less of an issue. So now, with Ecuador, we're specifically doing a share model, so they're not going to take all the risk, but they're going to come into it with us part way. So that's fair. Uh, we've had other conversations with um, farms in London and California, and if they don't want to jump in bed four million, and maybe they don't want two and two, maybe that's just like, you know, no, we're kind of we're a $1 million risk company, not a $4 million risk company. We will work with them to go to their government, whether it's regional or state or provincial, and be like, hey, listen, we're going to give all the food back to the community. Like, let's see if we can do this together. Maybe we can all come with their way. Right, but we'll try and, our model is a little flexible, and without sort of getting into the whole economic side of things. The food that's being thrown up, so if you take the 50% of food that's being thrown up, is it literally, a resource that we're wasting. I don't want to say the full model is 100% margin, but it really is. So let's take the 100% margin of all the produce that's being raised, right? That's that huge number we said at the beginning, right? Let's revenue share whatever, 10, 15, 20%. Okay, we'll take 50, 60, 70% work for profit. And these things are huge to operate. And we're a tech company. Our burn rate is through the roof right now, okay? but. We'll take that other 10, 15% and give that back to the community. We're not going to grow. I mean, currently, right now, we are growing food and we're going to fly. We're going to fly as a powder, we're going to fly as a whole mango. So we're still doing better by the planet, right, from a footprint perspective. But we have the ability to have more of a flexible model because we're starting with 100% margin, right? So that's a little bit of how we can do it. But there's purchase, there's rent, there's rent to own. There's a whole bunch of different variations, but the, the challenge is there's a higher value in a tomato and a mango commodity than there is in a potato or a lettuce. So depending on what your farm grows, that might fluctuate the model. So if you want to challenge me on the model, 
get a buddy drink. That's a different conversation. But if you want to have a conversation about the general model, that's kind of the way it works. Because not every farm can afford four million. We don't expect that. But we want to rescue food. It starts with food, and we want to get food back into the communities of where that food is grown. And so we'll find a way to make it work. We're not. If we make a hundred million, great. It's fine making ninety-eight. And he actually, if you meet the guy, he doesn't care about money because he's. Out of other people's meal, at the end of the meal, like he's done that, so he's faced it, you know. And so that's that. You know, we all went to that mental health one. That's all relative. It's really big in the restaurant community, and that's where they grew up. So that stuff's really important. Because we're an equitable company. That's where it starts, and we're going to try and make sure it ends that way too. Good question. Thanks. Does the food waste all of the farm meat, or is there other spots in supply chain that is wasted? Oh man, I could ask this about two hours ago. Uh, no, it's not, you know, I don't need I don't this question, but you, you get asked, and it's, it's an important question. We get asked it all the time. Um, we get asked about food waste because sometimes you start talking to people in the community, and the natural assumption around food that's being thrown out is post consumption. Yeah. Okay. So, out in Vancouver, BC plays our football field, is co owned with our convention center. And I went to a reverse pitch with BC Place, and they throw away a lot of 75 million tons of food. So they're wondering what to do with the food that is half a hot dog, fries thrown out. Okay, that's a much harder thing. Okay, right now they're paying to compost it, and then they pay the compost to travel with it. That's a massive expense because the compost is still heavy. Okay, I'm not saying we could solve that with biotrim. We've never tried to test post consumption. We get asked all the time, and I think we'll do it at some point. You know, and with our partnership with YVR, that's another one. Air, airports throw away a lot of food. We can't really touch the airline food, international airline food. We might be able to touch like a WestJet or a smaller airline to see what food they're throwing away in whole that we can commodity test. But post-consumption is really tricky. Aside from composting or animal feed, I don't know, but it, it will be something that we'll get to later. Um, it's just down, it's down the road, and it's you have to think of the economics behind it. Like if we're going to do it, because we're going to already be a three hundred million dollar company, it's a fifty thousand fifty million dollar research project. I was thinking like wholesale line too, like Loblaws. Hey, I'm sure there's yeah, there. yeah. You know, a few of us were in Europe earlier this summer, and um, I met uh, one of the buyers for the largest grocery store in Switzerland, and uh, we're going down that road with them. It's just taking a long time, but you know, signing NDAs and all that kind of stuff. But um, they want to address all their food waste and all the grocery stores. But they have a hub where it mostly takes place, so there is that opportunity. Uh, and they're really integrated. Their government food system, and like they'll all support it, which is great. Um, but there is conversation at that distributor level. Um, it has to be a lot. Like it has to. Your grocery store has to be a big grocery store, and you got to be throwing away. But that's okay. If, if you're a BT 1000 and you can get up to 800, it'll be worth it. Right. So, good question. Yeah. There's something. That was kind of my question. I was just thinking. Yeah. My children work in the grocery store. Yeah. And I look at the grocery store and they come home and just tell me the waste that food that's thrown out constantly because the way it was transported, you know, the, it's too cold or too hot in the container or yeah. whatever, and just the pure waste at that point in time to you. And then just a weird, weird thought, just could you ever like gum this down to a, a small, like in-house size? Like you were talking about your bananas sure. or like everything like that. Like you could have like a little firm one in your house and you just have like a little Sure. Like I freeze Dude. my bananas for sweets yeah, yeah, and stuff no, like no, that. No, no. It's like if I could shrink it down to this size instead of filling up my freezer, let me, let me So let me just address the, the grocery one. Um, it's not the first time it's come up. Okay, and I think the grocery store has to be really progressive. And I would say that in Europe, they're on it. They want to address it, they've approached us. We've been there and we've spoken to them. So it, you know, it's possible. I would say that the conversations we've had with some of our Canadian grocery stores are less open about what they're throwing away. We, have, we know how much they only throw away. What they publicly say and what they are doing are very different numbers. And Okay, well, you'll get there eventually when the public puts enough pressure on you, but the grocery store is a, is a good one, and I'm sorry to hear that 
your family talks about it. But that goes back to my first comment. We should be talking about this all the time. So you know, good on the education. In terms of a personal, <laughs> that's that. <laughs> First, like a household bio trim, I've never thought about that. Um, we've we have those Lomi devices which put things in those compost. Yeah, you know, one you yeah. put on the kitchen yeah. counter, when you yeah. throw your food waste, and one time you wake up, it's like yeah. a little yeah. thing. Um, no one's ever, honestly, no one's ever asked that. <laughs> I told you it was weird. Uh, <laughs> no, like, it's it's not a weird question, it's actually tennis, a brilliant, right? a brilliant the, question. You know, the spring mix or spinach that goes in your. And like you forget that it's there two right. weeks later, you're like, well, I can't eat this. Yeah, thing. yeah. Um, well, you only freeze so much stuff. Sorry, yeah. the guy just wrote out a freezer space for stuff. It's it's freeze cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, <laughs> great question. We'll see if we can get the uh, three and a half million down to an affordable. Uh, I don't know what that looks like. But we'll see if we get a hundred dollar version. I don't know. What that looks like. <laughs> in twenty years, you'll be like, yeah. Oh, this is being filmed. Please don't say that. No, 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 what yeah, super cool question. Yeah, yeah. So we believe that the uh, BioTrim and Call of the Talents in Ecuador uh, will be 10, 10 to 15 jobs. Okay. Um, some of them do have to be kind of food science and food science engineers, mm -hmm. but um, some of the jobs on the farm can absolutely convert. Right. The person that puts the f carries the food in and puts it in the sanitizer is just blue light. Right. You're just putting it in. So there's jobs that you can do. Some of them are in the, in the educational sciences side of things. Um, and then there's still sort of the packaging and the, the, the sales of the product. But we believe it's about 10 to 15 jobs per kind of a little unit, like a 1,000, um, of which four to six of those jobs could be like from farm, like with the farm staff. Uh, and then the other ones, and that's a part of the model that you asked about how does it work. Uh, we would cooperate with them, so some of them would be our staff. If you want to pay them, then the model looks a little different. But uh, we're sort of about 10 to 15 jobs. Super relevant question. Because that comes down to funding, right? Because if we apply for one in British Columbia, we would go after government support for new jobs and staff and training and so forth. Whereas we have to learn all those programs and funding programs in other parts of the world. Uh, in Ecuador, they don't have a lot of funding programs. So that's relevant to their model. And are you looking at automating any of those portions of the, the process in it? Like, yeah. You know, there's lots of different robotic ways of, of packaging your items. Yeah, no, 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 it's a good question. And I think when the unit becomes macro, like the grounded unit, not the mobile one, the answer becomes yes. Yeah. Or it gets closer to yes. Um, I, but I don't have the math on, you know, 1,000, 15 jobs, a 25,000 is not linear math. But good question. Oh, escape. Easy. You guys are so nice on the last day, I can relax. Thanks for coming, thanks for listening. Oh. And uh, I've heard of you.